On my mega fave numbers video, a commenter named Carl Johnson mentioned a James Grime video on Numberphile about the ending digit of prime numbers and an interesting thing that was discovered about that. I'm linking that video in the description because it's an enjoyable video, but you don't need to watch it to understand my video. My video is going to be discussing this graph. But in order to explain this graph, we need to look over a bit of foundational groundwork first. The first key fact that we need to know is that every prime number larger than 3 is of the pattern 6n plus or minus 1. To prove this, I'm going to use base 6 mathematics, because I'll need to use base 6 to prove another point anyway. First of all, in base 6 we only use the numbers 0 through 5. Because base 6 is an even base, just like base 10 is even, then any number that ends in 0, 2, or 4 is also even. That is to say, those numbers are divisible by 2. So if a number in base 6 ends in 0, 2, or 4, then it cannot be prime, barring the exception of 2 itself, of course. That leaves us with numbers ending in 1, 3, or 5. Now in base 6, the number 3 functions very similarly to the number 5 in base 10. Just as any number that ends in 5 or 0 in base 10 is divisible by 5, in base 6, any number that ends in 0 or 3 is divisible by 3. To give a few examples, if you multiply 3 times 3 in base 6, the result looks like 13 in base 10. And you can check this because the 3 is in our 1's column, and the 1 is in our 6's column. 6 to the first power is 6, and 6 plus 3 is 9. To give another example, 3 times 6, yes, that 10 corresponds to the value of 6 in base 6, is 18, which looks like 30. Again, we have 0 in the 1's column and 3 in the 6's. 6 times 3 equals 18. So you can see any number ending in 0 or 3 is divisible by 3 in base 6. That means the only possible numbers left to be prime are those numbers that end in 1 or 5, because any even number and 3 cannot be prime in base 6. Numbers ending in 1 correspond to 6n plus 1 in base 10, and numbers ending in 5 correspond to 6n minus 1 in base 10. Therefore, all prime numbers greater than 3 are in the pattern of 6n plus or minus 1. So let's call a number ending in 1 or 5 in base 6 a p number. The p stands for possibly prime. It's only possible, not guaranteed. But here's the other reason I wanted to stay in base 6. It turns out that if a p number is not prime, then the only possible factors it can have are other p numbers. This is easy to show because it cannot be 0, 2, or 4 since those are even numbers and multiplying any number by an even number means the answer has to be even 2. We can never reach 1 or 5 that way. And furthermore, since 3 in base 6 functions like 5 in base 10, then any multiple of 3 has to end in 0 or 3, 2. That means the only way to multiply factors together to get results that end in 1 or 5 is if you are multiplying other numbers that end in 1 or 5. And since numbers that end in 1 or 5 are what we've defined as p numbers, the only possible factors a p number can have is other p numbers. Pretty straightforward if I do say so myself. Now, what does that mean for prime numbers? If we have a number greater than 3 and we don't know if it's prime or not, the first thing we can do is check if it's a p number. If it's not a p number, it's not prime. And you can tell if it's a p number by dividing it by 6. If the remainder is 1 or 5, then it's a p number. Once that's done, you just need to check if it has any p numbers smaller than itself that divide into it evenly. Actually, you don't even have to check all of those values. You only need to check the p numbers that are up to the square root of the value you're looking for. The reason why is because the square root of a number is the largest possible factor a number can have that does not have a correspondingly smaller value that pairs with it. To show what I mean, consider the number 100. That's 10 squared, which means 10 is the largest possible number that does not have a corresponding pair with it. Now clearly, 100 is also divisible by 50, and 50 is larger than 10. But 50 has the corresponding factor pair of 2, because 2 times 50 equals 100. So if you've already found 2 as a factor, you don't need to look for 50. You've gotten 50 when you found 2. The same thing with 5 and 20. You don't need to find 20 since you've already found 5. Since p numbers account for 2 out of every 6 numbers, and since you only need to search up to the square root of the value you're looking at, then you really don't need to do that many checks to find out if a number is prime. 
A number as large as 1 million can be verified whether it's prime or not by checking no more than 334, uh, we'll round up to account for the fraction, of P numbers. But uh, I couldn't just leave it at that. Given P numbers can be the only numbers that could possibly be factors of other P numbers, I realized that when examining prime numbers, we only need to look at P numbers to find patterns. And in this case, I found two patterns in the way that P numbers block other numbers from being prime. Before defining the patterns, let's look at this graph and let me explain how to read it. First, we see that there are black and red squares. A red square will correspond to a 6n plus 1 value, and a black square corresponds to a 6n minus 1 value. The value for n is determined by the column that the square is in. So far, it's pretty straightforward. The complicating aspect is the rows. The first row is 5, then 7, then 11, then 13. In other words, it's every p number starting with 6n minus 1, then 6n plus 1, uh, again, starting from when n equals 1 and increasing n. So each row is actually only one part of it, 6n minus 1 or 6n plus 1. All the odd numbers are 6n minus 1, and the even-numbered rows are 6n plus 1. So again, to explain this, let's look at the first red square at d1. Since d is in the fourth column, we know we're looking at n equals 4 for the column. And since it's red, we know we're looking at 6n plus 1. Putting that together, we get 6 times 4 plus 1. That's 24 plus 1, or 25. And we're saying 25 is not prime. Since this is row 1, we can conclude that the factor of 5 is what blocks 25 from being prime. Which is, of course, obvious because 25 is 5 times 5. But again, this is just explaining the graph. Now we see that column F is blocked by both row 1 and row 2, and both are colored black. Black means that it's of the pattern 6n minus 1, and since f is the 6th row, that's 6 times 6 minus 1, or 36 minus 1, which is 35. And this is saying that 35 is blocked by both row 1, which is 5, and row 2, which is 7. Again, that's obvious to check because 35 is 7 times 5. Now let's just look at row 1 for the moment. Very clearly you can see a pattern here. After an initial skip of 3, you have a red square, then a skip, then a black square, then two skips, and that repeats forever. In reality, the initial skip of three is really a skip of one, followed by the repeating pattern of skip two, red, skip one, black, skip two, red, skip one, black. So that's pretty interesting. Now when we look at the second row, we see it starts with a skip of five, then black, skip one, red. As before, the initial skip is really skipping one, then the pattern establishes of skipping four, black, skip one, red, skip four, black, skip one, red. Now those two patterns are close, but slightly different. To see how the patterns are really established, let's compare row one with row three. Remember, row one corresponds to five and row three to 11, since every other row is six and minus one. So with row 3, let's find out how big the gap is between black and red. If you count it up, it's 6. The initial skip is 8, so we skip 2, then we skip our 6, have a red square, skip 3, black, skip 6, red, skip 3, black, and so on. With this, you might already be able to see the pattern for the 6n minus 1 values. But let's put in row 5 to make it a little clearer. For row 5, we start by skipping 3, then we skip 10, red, skip 5, black, skip 10, red, skip 5, black, and so on. So what is this pattern? Again, remember that the odd-numbered rows are representing 6n minus 1 values, so the initial skip that we do is pretty obvious. That skip is exactly the same as the value for n, so first we skip n. The next part is a bit trickier to see, but we can still express this in terms of n. After we skip n, we skip 4n minus 2. When n equals 1, 4n minus 2 is equal to 2. And when n equals 2, 4n minus 2 is equal to 6, and so on. Then we put in a red square and skip 2n minus 1. Again, when n equals 1, 2n minus 1 equals 1. And when n equals 2, 2n minus 1 equals 3, and so on. After that, we put in our black square and then repeat the 4n minus 2 skip. So we have this sequence creating the odd-numbered values. 
The even numbers are almost identical to the odd numbers. The only difference is the gap in the first skip isn't 4n minus 2, it's just 4n. Also, the even numbers begin with a black square instead of a red square. So now that we have the patterns, we can program a Visual Basic script to create our graph. And that code looks like this. I'll also try and post that into the description. It should be short enough that you can copy it from there if you want. So now we look at our graph and we can see that it functions as a prime number sieve. Whatever columns do not have a square at all, the 6n plus or minus 1 value for that column means we have a twin prime. If there's only a red square, 6n minus 1 is prime for that value of n, but 6n plus 1 is not prime. And if there's only a black square, 6n plus 1 is prime, but 6n minus 1 is not. Finally, if both a red and black square exist, the 6n plus and minus 1 are both not prime for that value of n. So the first three columns are all twin primes, and that corresponds to 5 and 7, 11 and 13, and 17 and 19. But then the next column has a red square, so the 6n plus 1 value is blocked. Sure enough, 23 is prime, but 25 is not. Then we have another twin prime as well, 29 and 31 are prime. And the next value blocks 6n minus 1. Sure enough, 35 is not prime, but 37 is. Then we have another twin prime for 41 and 43, and so on. So there you go. This graph shows the two patterns that are used to block prime numbers. Both patterns are quite similar to each other, and both patterns get ever spread out as you go further down the graph. And it's the interplay between all of these patterns that determines whether or not a prime number can even exist for that column. And what I find most interesting is all of these patterns are, are strict. They repeat exactly each time, and each row has its, it's exactly related to the previous versions of it. And there's no variation. It's not random. This is very deterministic. And yet the results that we get end up being very chaotic because the interplay between these, it's so chaotic, it's so hard to predict in advance that in fact, we still can't predict in advance exactly what prime numbers will be out there. We have to calculate and prove whether a number is prime or not. It's all based on these simple little patterns that relate to each other in complex, chaotic ways. And it's just yet another way that mathematics is so awesome. Anyway, if you guys enjoyed this, uh, hit the like button, subscribe, and have a wonderful day. Peace out.